The information is for your listening pleasure, but is not offering you any personal advice. If you have heard something that you feel may be relevant to yourself, please visit your medical practitioner or mental health provider. Hello and welcome to Life Changes You. I'm Daniel. I hope you've had another great week. We've had some great guests this season so far in season three. And today it's Mark Julius who is um, a podcaster and writer. He's got a podcast called Vicious Whispers. And uh, he's got a really important message today that I think is really valuable to lots of people out there to listen to. But I'm going to let Mark uh, give us an overview of his life so far. So hello, Mark. How are you? I'm doing awesome, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, When I saw what your podcast was all about, I wanted to be on it. Uh, I think you have a very powerful message. Um, It's so much in line with what I want to do, how I want to get people to look at their mental health, their brain health. I think it's something that a lot of people don't do. I know I never cared about my brain health. I was very self-destructive. I played high school football, played college football, ended up going to Brown University, and I played there for a little bit. Uh, but I was also tried to be a professional boxer with no amateur experience. Terrible idea. I don't recommend it. Wow. I was in Vegas getting destroyed by guys that were 17 and 0. You know, guys I was watching on TV and I was coming in with no experience and they were putting me in sparring against these guys. And so I was getting my brain battered. Um, I went into MMA. I wasn't any good at that either. What is MMA? Uh, mixed martial arts. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, one of my fights back in 2004 was when I stopped trying to fight. I had a fight scheduled in Australia, but then the fighter that was going to go with me couldn't go and I didn't want to go by myself and they weren't going to pay for a coach. So I backed out. But yeah, so I I did MMA. Then I've had lots of jobs. I was a prison guard, a correctional officer for a bit, a juvenile probation officer for a bit. But the whole time I was trying to fight, I mean, I was also writing that entire time. So I was writing dark fiction, mainly I started off with horror stories, but now I have over a dozen books of fiction. I have a young adult interactive series where called Try Not to Die, where uh, it's kind of like the old choose your own adventures where every couple of pages, the reader has to choose what happens. But in this series, if you choose wrong, you die. So I already have four in that series and I have another about 15, 16 planned for the next four years. And so... Um, yeah, it's uh, I love writing. It's what I do. I didn't want to write nonfiction. I, my first nonfiction book was Unlocking the Cage. I wrote that to try to understand why I had ever fought. No one could understand why I was a fighter because when I was a bouncer, when I was a security guard, when I was a bodyguard, I was the guy that always wanted to break up fights. I didn't want any confrontation. I never wanted to hurt anybody. I never tried to use my power like that. Uh, same as a prison guard and And I could never understand why I did, especially when I wasn't making any money. I was, you know, getting my brain battered, my body battered. I didn't have time. I was getting very little sleep. Uh, So I could never understand why. So I went around the country. I interviewed 340 fighters and then about 60 coaches to try to understand who they were, why they were fighting. And that way I could figure out who I was and why I had done it. And then that's what ended up leading me to, in that process, because I wanted to prove I was tough and everything else. And I was still a fighter. I got back into sparring. I was taking a lot of damage. I got some more concussions. And fortunately, my friend who was uh, my photographer, he said, hey, man, he's like, have you looked into brain damage? Because you're getting your ass kicked by guys that are half your age and three times the talent. And, you know, he's like, you might be tough, but he's like, you, you got to be careful. And so that's what started me looking at traumatic brain injuries and when I started looking at it, I had a lot of friends come out and say, you know, they, they would write, send me messages saying, hey, man, um, you know, I didn't do anything after Brown um, like you did. He said, but my brain's a mess. You know, my brain's destroyed. My brain is ruined. I don't know what I'm going to do. There are a couple of different friends from Brown. Uh, then I had different MMA fighters. And so that was the incentive for me to really look at it. Uh, it was very depressing. I found out like when I had to look at my own damage this whole time, I thought I was fine. I yeah. think as men, we're fine. Whatever however we are, that's just who we are. It doesn't matter that I'm angry. It doesn't matter that I, you know, I, I might rage. It doesn't matter that I might be impulsive and that I, you know, I, I can't control certain things. It doesn't matter. Like that's just who I am, right? So, um, but when I got the brain scans back and I, you know, had to look at like, oh wow, my frontal cortex or whatever is very so severely under functioning, you know, uh, it's supposed to be green, but it was really like dark blue in areas. 
Wow. You know, I hadn't been getting quality sleep for a very long time. Um, I took the IVA 2 test, which is uh, a visual and audio uh, testing. And I showed up as uh, positive for like ADHD uh, because my focus was so terrible, my, especially my auditory. Uh, if you and I were having a conversation, I could be trying to understand, like pay attention to it, but there was a good chance I wouldn't follow it. Um, you know, and so it was nice for me to see in a way, I was like, oh, I'm not being lazy. It's like, I told my wife, I was like, it's not that I don't want to listen to you. It's like, I really got an issue. The awesome thing was through all the different things I did, I was able to recover like incredible function, you know? And so when I started, it was incredibly depressing, especially talking to guys that I trained with that were having brain issues. But when I was reading how plastic the brain is, you know, how people can improve their brain. Like that gave me hope. And once I had hope, I was like, okay, who do I need to see to fix this? You know, because before it used to be the, the general consensus, what, what everyone thought was you could start going downhill, you hit your forties, you know, it's just a decline. You, you're just going to get worse. And especially if you're a boxer or a football player or anything else, like you're not going to go up, you're not going to get better. You're going to go <laughs> down. It's, it's, you're going to have dementia or, or whatever. That's the fear. That's what it used to be. But it's like, no, like we can fix our brain. Like uh, the biggest thing for me, the first step was uh, I heard Joe Rogan's podcast with Dr. Mark Gordon and he had on special forces, uh, Andrew Marr. And at first I didn't want to listen to it, but a couple of friends sent it to me. I listened to it and it was amazing what they're talking about and how the way that he explained traumatic brain injuries, you know, I used to always think of it just as a major concussion, which I had, like, I've been knocked unconscious so many times, but how it's the repetitive blows to the head there, you know, it's the, the small blows it, it's playing soccer, you know, as a kid and heading that ball over and over and over. I have a friend, he said he played from like five years old through college. Uh, and then even after that, he said, throughout training, you know, you're throwing the ball at each other and you're hitting it with your head. Um, and now they're realizing how terrible that is, what it's doing to all these athletes, you know, not everyone, but um, yeah. So it, learning what a concussion was, was big for me, seeing the damage and then realizing, you know, I could change it. So I, I sent off my blood work for Dr. Gordon. Uh, we got it back and everything was consistent with someone that's had multiple TBIs. I had low testosterone. But what they did, he just put me on uh, different supplements. Only one was prescription, and that was to raise my testosterone, uh, Clomid, small pill. Everything else was like vitamin D and pregnenolone, all these different things you could just get from the store. Two weeks into it, I was in my backyard. I started crying. Normally, my routine would be I would drop off the kids at school, 8 o'clock, go into the backyard, get super, super high, and then try to write. But I would be high all day. Uh, yeah. cannabis has been a big part of my life. And now writing the book, I got to realize like, oh, I've been covering all this up. I've been using cannabis to, to mask all this yeah. anger and inflammation and, you know, depression and anxiety. And so I'm in the backyard getting ready to smoke. And I started crying and I broke down and I was like, not because anything was bad, but I, there was just like, I was like, oh my God, I was like, all this all this weight on me that I didn't even know was there has been lifted or a lot of it enough yeah. to make me realize like, Oh, Oh my God, I can't believe that was my normal, uh, you know, with all this depression and how angry and, you know, always just like this. Um, so that was the first step. And that was just at the very beginning that dropped my need for cannabis and my desire to use cannabis in about half. Um, I felt so much better. After that, I found uh, neurofeedback in NUCA, which is a type of chiropractic, um, that specializes just on the top two vertebrae. And so I, I had a huge adjustment there. I was really out of whack, which you'll see from, you know, bad car accidents and, uh, playing football or getting your brain bashed in, uh, fighting. So I had that done that probably helped, but at the same time I did the neural feedback and, you know, we, we saw the different parts of my brain that were under functioning, the parts that were related to sleep. And those are the parts that they went after first, either raising them or lowering them like the yeah. alpha waves or the beta waves or whatever it was, which I can't remember. And then that is what increased my focus scores. My cognitive scores uh, went up incredible in so many different areas. That's not what we were going for, but just because everything else got cleaned up because we got rid of the inflammation. And I think that's one of the important things for people to realize too, with the traumatic brain injuries, like all of a sudden you're in your forties and you don't know why you're like this. And you can, you can just attribute it to life or whatever, or that's just how you are. But it's like, 
man, this might be a process that started 20 years ago. Cause when you had this traumatic brain injury or when you had this repetitive stuff, it started this inflammation process in your brain. It never cleared up that prevented your hormones from regulating themselves. So once your hormones are completely out of regulation, then that's going to control your emotions. Like, so getting that straightened out was huge. I think that should be one of the first steps you know, being able to fine tune it with the neurofeedback was awesome. But another important part, which I often forget to talk about, which is equally as important was the emotional part to talking to a therapist. Yeah. Originally, I wanted to do that part only to trace my progress or decline or whatever. I wanted him to look at me and to get an idea who I was and to see where I was going. And I was also a little interested in knowing why I was so dark, why I've always been fixated on death, why, you know, I was suicidal most of my life, you know, so I wanted to kind of get at that. But right when I was about to start all that, my wife was like, well, you need to go to therapy for us too, because it was causing lots of marital problems. And so that was what made me get in there. And that was super important just to understand myself, because even though, you know, let's say we fix the inflammation in the brain and our hormones are regulated. And, you know, now my brain waves are where they're supposed to be. I still have these same coping mechanisms, right? I still have these same triggers. I still mm-hmm. have these, you know, I'm going to react the same way to this as I used to when I had this anger issue, you know, mm-hmm. or, you know, or whatever the, the a less ability to handle it. So I, that was crucial. So, and I think it's something that so many people don't want to do. They think, Oh, I have to go talk to someone. And uh, man, it, it, it was awesome. Uh, like if you want to improve, if you don't like where you are, like I, I urge everyone, like take an honest look at yourself. It's not easy. Don't say, Oh, well, that's just who I am. And, and I can't change. Cause that is the easy way to do it. That's what most people say. I was like, okay, if you want to be like that and miserable the rest of your life, then go for it. But for me, like I knew I owe, owed it to myself. I owed it to my family for my, like my kids. One of the, one of the scary things with TBI, I mean, it's not necessarily just TBI and, and PTSD, I would say is very tied to TBIs. There's, there's a huge overlap, but I have several friends that have the same thing where there's this fear that you're going to completely throw away your life in a matter of seconds and not even know it. And, and really like have very, very little control over it, you know? And, and for me, that's always been like, okay, if someone confronts me or someone, even if someone honks at me or whatever, even though I tell myself like, like I'm incredibly calm, I do yoga all the time. That's one of my coping mechanisms. I do breathing. I've, I found all these things that make me relax. I, you know, I love, I have cats on me all day long while I'm writing <laughs> horror stories. I, I'm a nice guy, but if someone, you know, flips me off or whatever, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm triggered. I'm ready to fight. I don't care what happens. Like knowing, knowing that like, okay, the best thing that could happen is, I don't know. There's, there's no good solutions. Like, but someone, I might go get arrested. I might get sued. I might, who knows what over, over nothing, over a perceived, you know, slight, you know, and a lot of guys have that where they just, you know, they worry about that. Um, is not in the book, but recently I just did a type of uh, trauma release hypnosis, a uh, 12 week session, which was awesome. And part of that was on releasing anger. And it was pretty amazing. I didn't think it was going to work. I didn't think it was going to help. I'd already had success with the hypnosis for some other things with some eating stuff and another thing, but it wasn't the trauma release. But um, I was able to go like to a concert. I was worried about going to a heavy metal concert at the Hollywood Palladium because I've had so many fights at the Hollywood Palladium. I was a bouncer there. Um, I went to so many shows there and heavy metal shows. And so I was worried about going there because I'm always on the lookout. You know, I feel like I've been, um, you know, primed or trained for violence, uh, kind of wired for it. But after this hypnosis session, like I was able to go, I went with my wife and daughter. I was standing there the whole time. I wasn't looking for trouble. I wasn't thinking anyone was going to attack me or, 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 you know, start anything. And it was just such a freeing and, like liberating feeling. It's like, okay, I'm not afraid of myself anymore. I'm not afraid of how I might react. So, but yeah, I, I'd say whatever your issue is, whatever you're not happy with, whatever, um, you know, that something can be done about it and you just have to figure out what it is. Um, you know, what, something that works for me may not work for someone else. Someone might hate yoga, you know, but they just love walking whatever it is, whether it's a treatment or uh, a type of therapy or type of exercise, there's just so much out there to help us deal with our mental health instead of just burying it, instead of just putting on the TV, instead of looking at our phone and pretending it's not there. You've, you've just 
talked about so many different things that I think are important. And it seems like um, from where you were when you were younger to where you are now, even though you still feel like you've got this fight in you, you're a lot calmer. And so all these different things that you had, like the ADHD, hormone imbalance, having the cannabis, these are all things. So was the ADHD part of you before you had the brain injury or was it I guess you don't know because it was diagnosed after. Yeah. And, and that, that's, what's hard too. And, and, and one of the things I want to make clear at the start of the book is like, okay, I don't know if where I'm at, it's because of genetics. I don't know if it's because of diet. I don't know if it's environment. I don't know if it's because I was spanked. I don't know if it's, you know, because of that first time I got a concussion when I was six or seven, but I do know I have these symptoms. So I know we need to attack these symptoms. So whether it was because of the traumatic brain injuries or not, um, yeah, it's like, okay, I, I gotta, I gotta deal with it. Yeah. And look, you also said about, um, uh, that talking to others, you've been talking to others about TBIs. And I guess if these are guys who are in the sporting field, you know, like different sports they're playing, do you find resistance from them when you start to tell them what could happen? What is a possibility? Do you find them going, oh, that won't happen to me? Or, oh, you know, I'm not worried about that. Because I guess for a lot of people as well, some of these sports that they play, that might be the thing that they're really good at in their life. So playing football, Australian rules football, um, you know, that's what they th- feel like they were born to do. And then for someone to say, well, look, this is what happened to me. And there is a possibility it could happen to you. How do they come back to you with it, with a response? And how do you sort of say, well, look, I'm just giving you some advice because I could imagine the passion in them would be almost overruling what you're saying. I think it makes it to where you can't even hear it. Um, and, and because most of them, I think, are incredibly nihilistic, they still have that feeling of, I'm screwed. So a lot, like with me, I didn't care. I didn't care what was going to happen to my brain because I was suicidal. So I was like, I didn't have the strength to kill myself, but I was like, eh, if I die in the ring or whatever, I don't care. And so I did definitely didn't care what was going to happen 20 years later. And, you know, and that desire for me was an identity or in all these other things. So a lot of these fighters, one, they probably don't know. And yeah, I think they just don't care. They don't think it's going to happen to them. Um, you know, especially a teenager, teenagers are indestructible. Right. And, yeah, I, I, it's really hard. Um, a big part of my book, uh, which I dedicate to my friend, Michael Porman, uh, he was one of the players from Brown who he ended up dying during the writing of it. Uh, when he contacted me, he knew he didn't have long to live. He was fighting leukemia and he couldn't fight it. He couldn't do chemo anymore because his brain was in such a bad place with the CTE from all the traumatic brain injuries that, um, yeah, he just had to, he knew he, his time was limited. So he brought me to his house several times, meet his family to interview him, his wife. Um, it was, uh, incredibly difficult. It was also incredibly, uh, motivating. He, he showed me how to face death. Like that's how I want to go. He, he spent it loving his family and enjoying life and, uh, spend time with friends and, and sharing his message. But, my point is during the, our conversation, after saying all this terrible stuff and all these things he had, he had gone through and, you know, all these troubles that it caused their family, I asked him if he would do it again. And he said, oh yeah, hundred percent. And his wife was pretty upset about it. She's like, oh my God, Michael, how could, how could you say that you would do this again? You know, knowing that it's put you where you are now. He's like, well, it, you know, all those friendships, all everything that I got, you know, it got me into college. It got me into you know, and I'm kind of in the same place, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. It gave me a lot. Who knows how I would have been without it. And especially that I've been able to stop this process of this damage. You know, I got through everything. Hopefully I will not develop CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, fun word to say. Uh, That's the neurodegenerative disease that so many American football players have that I think rugby players are starting to have that you're seeing the soccer players Uh, My belief, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I'm the furthest thing from it, but if we stop the inflammation process in the brain, if our hormones are regulated, if our sleep is fixed, 
then we should not go down that path. I don't believe. So with my mother, uh, one of the amazing things because of this book, the results that I had with neurofeedback got me to almost force my mom to go get her brain mapped. Uh, she'd been having terrible sleep the last 10 years. I, she's about 80 years old. Her sister has advanced uh, dementia, uh, will never recover. Like she's in a hospital, super sad. And my mom was definitely headed that way. We could tell. And so uh, I took her to get her brain mapped. And again, it, it showed that she was like definitely headed towards dementia. Uh, her scores were very low. But after I think 30 sessions of neurofeedback, now she sleeps through the night. Uh, so that's all cleared out. She's functioning so much better. Whenever I see her, like she's always giving us hugs. And sometimes she'll break down in tears because of how much of a difference it's made for. And so if she does have dementia, it's at least postponed. Um, but I have a feeling, you know, hopefully we'll be able to avoid it. And if we need to, we can, you know, do some more sessions of neurofeedback to, to try to clean up that sleep again, if it becomes a problem. And look, what you're saying there is amazing because there are so many advances in uh, medical technology and medical breaks throughs and helping people and it's like listening to someone like you I would imagine there would be people out there that will hear this podcast and go actually I never thought of neurofeedback and I never thought of getting my hormones checked I know when I got fibromyalgia 10-15 years ago uh, basically I did all these tests with all these different specialists who then said well it's fibromyalgia because I couldn't find anything else wrong and then they say to you well there's nothing we can do about it so you just carry on with your life and it was only uh, a couple of months ago that I had a blood test done and my blood sugars had gone up over the last two years and they kept saying to me you need to do a diet you need to do more exercise and I say look I've got a good diet now don't eat any any chocolate, any soft drink, um, at, but it's my blood sugar's not going down. I'm putting on more weight. Um, and so I went on some medication, which uh, I think it's for type 2 diabetes. And the brain fog I've had for the last five years has lifted. I used to drive to work, yawning my head off, drive home at four o'clock in the afternoon, yawning my head off, go home and have a sleep for two hours. And just taking that medication, I'm now up at seven and I go to bed at 10 and I don't feel tired through the day and I'm starting to drop weight. I'm not hungry all the time. And so those imbalances, which I they just kept saying to me, oh, you need to do diet. That intervention with that medication has changed my whole life around. And unless I'd had that blood test and said, look, I want to try the medication, I'd still be on that feeling tired, not knowing what to do. And is this my life, you know? Yeah. And that's awesome that you had that experience. And I think that's important to point out too, that you have to be your own advocate, right? Because uh, most doctors, they aren't going to know this stuff. You know, they haven't learned it. This is some of this is cutting edge. Some of it, they don't want to believe. Uh, some of it maybe hasn't had enough studies behind it or whatever else. Um, so yeah, you probably have to want to get the help and yeah, and, and almost demand it. Uh, yeah, you have to push it, don't you? Because mm -hmm. I think in our heads as well, we think, oh, I'm going to the doctors and I'm going to say, I think this and this is wrong. Um, and you say that to them and they go, okay, well, it's this. Whereas if you added the other three or four symptoms in your having, they'll go, oh, no, 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 this is that. So mm -hmm. you have to really, I mean, when I had fibromyalgia, when I was diagnosed, I had two A4 sheets of everything that was going wrong with me. And wow. doctors would look through it and go, okay, we can work on this, 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 and this, and they do that. And then the next doctor would go, okay, we'll take this off. And one doctor said to me, why have you got so many symptoms? And I go, I don't know. That's why I'm here. But once they go through all the things, you start to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing. That's one of the things that uh, like Dr. Gordon I was talking, I had him on my podcast and I was asking him, I was like, well, what does he do different than other doctors? Like is what he does, could other doctors just do the same thing? Is this something that, especially in the U S that, you know, will be picked up. And he's like, no, it, it won't be. He wishes it would. And so he's just getting more doctors underneath him. He's expanding his network. That's one way to, to bring about change because yeah. Um, whether it's insurance companies, not wanting to pay for it or, or whatever the holdup is. Yeah. He's, he's run into that. Well, look, when I was first sick, I did actually see a doctor somewhere in America. I can't remember where. And uh, what were they called? Uh, he put me on these uh, tablets, which were like a peptide. I can't remember what they were. But the reason I had to stop was it was too expensive. But when I was taking them, I had no illness whatsoever. I felt better than I'd ever felt. Oh, wow. But it was the fact that it was costing me eight or $900 a month. And I wasn't working at the time. And I just couldn't afford to keep that up. But it was yeah. the best thing I'd had. They were like um, 
I, I can't even think of the words now. But anyway, yeah, look, look, there are some some people out there who have different ways of dealing with things that can really make a difference, especially mm-hmm. medically. For sure. So you said about you weren't sure what your desire to fight was. There must have been something in you that made you want to go that way. Yeah, so that's being talking to all these different fighters is kind of what helped shed a light for me because I was able to see, you know, what similarities I have. Like, oh, okay, that guy reminds me a lot of me. He, you know, he's not winning his fights. Um, you know, he's partying, he's doing these different things. Or, you know, that guy, man, he's dedicated it to, for him. It's more of an art. And so I was able to see all these different types of fighters. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. It, you know, I didn't like what I saw about myself. I was like, but I was doing it for an identity. I wanted to be, you know, famous as a little kid. I wanted to be a pro football player. You know, that didn't work out. And so, you know, I wanted to go and become a wrestler or I wanted to become a fighter. I wanted to become famous. You know, I wanted yeah. some kind of fame. And, you know, I was no longer Mark, this quiet guy that's in the corner. Now I'm Mark, the fighter who women are attracted to or coming up to, you know, instead of, you know, me just being quiet and shy. And so I think that's probably what a big part of it was. And then also, you know, this self-hatred, like I would, I took a lot of stupid fights. I jumped into fights with very, very little training, just reckless. Uh, So I was doing it probably to hurt myself too. Um, So I was in a really dark place. So uh, you said yeah. also before that, you know, when you were younger, you thought about suicide quite a lot. Do you know what triggered that? What were the things that was it? Was it your childhood? Was it just something that happened? Was it the brain injury or? I don't know. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with perfectionism. The first time I went to a therapist, I only had one session with him 10 minutes into it. After I told him about myself, he's like, oh, he's like, you're a perfectionist. And I, I had never heard that before. I didn't know what it really was. Uh, never thought it would apply to me. But he's like, yeah, he's like, you're never going to be happy with yourself as long as you have that kind of thinking, because nothing you do will ever be good enough. You know, so I still have to deal with that. In fact, I had a huge realization in this last hypnosis session. I was like, oh, you know what? I should be grateful because I have reached so many of my goals. But what I do, I beat myself up. I'm like, oh, well, that book's not doing very good. And I didn't do much this week. And I'm always looking forward. I want to be productive. So wherever I'm at now isn't enough. I don't have enough listeners. I don't have enough readers. I don't you know, want any more. But when I stopped, I thought about it. I was like, no, I've already accomplished all my goals, you know, to, to write a story, to sell a book, to have someone say that I'm their favorite author, that I'm up there with Stephen King, like uh, to be able to have interviews, uh, this, being able to talk to someone in Australia, you know, yeah. and tomorrow I get to talk to someone in England, but having this one-on-one, I, that's why I'm excited about having you on my show next, because I get to find out about you. And for me, that's awesome. You know, I, I got to have that experience with so many fighters, you know, sometimes we just turn off the camera and it was like, one of us was crying or, or whatever. It's like, I've had some incredible experiences. I know I've helped some people with this TBI book. So I just am trying to focus on being grateful. I know that's an important thing. Uh, You know, I I think that's a good way to start your morning too. uh, being grateful. I I do that. And then I also think I was like, yeah, I was like, my kids might die today. My wife might die today. I might die today. So let's make it a good day. Let's enjoy it. Um, And that's kind of, I know it's a little dark, but really that, that does help me. So do you think it's your inner critic that's, continuously critiquing what you're doing. Yeah, I think he's still there. I've tried to get him to shut up. Uh, the hypnosis, the, the early hypnosis was for that because um, I had to look at that voice. The, the My inner voice is always calling myself a dumb shit. I'm a dumb shit. Like, so it doesn't matter that I graduated from a Ivy league school. That's why I always throw that out there too, because I don't want people thinking I'm a dumb shit. Cause I play football and I look like a dumb shit, you know, and I feel like a dumb shit. So that's always been in my head. Um, you know, and even though like I can look at my scores on, you know, lumosity or brain games or whatever else, or, but in my head, because of that perfectionism, because I always thought I wasn't good enough or smart enough. Um, yeah, that's something that I have to deal with. It's gone better with the hypnosis, but I do have to remind myself of it. I have to be aware of it. You know, I, I do a lot of self-reflection. I spend time in the sauna. You know, that's what yoga is for. I think a lot of us don't want to do that. We don't want to look at what's going on in our head, but I spend a lot of time there. If I'm not making up some fiction, you know, it's uh, trying to figure out myself. Yeah, look, I mean, I had the same problem when I started doing my counseling diploma. I was up to about the third uh, subject I had to do and I'd hired a mentor because I was just diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So I had a break from work and that's when I thought, oh, I'm going to get into this. 
And I got to the third book and uh, she said to me, you don't want to learn. And I said, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. And she said, no, 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 there's something blocking you that's happened in your past that's stopping you from retaining this information. You don't think you're good enough. And I go, no, 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 I think I'm good enough. And anyway, we worked it back. And it was a teacher when I was about eight or nine who had told all the boys in the class, you will amount to nothing. You're never going to do anything. You're just a waste of space. And that was what was blocking me. So every time I tried to learn something, my inner critic would go, you're not good enough. You don't know what you're talking about. You're rubbish. And to be honest, it's like I did get over that with my studies and passed everything, good good marks, it was great. Uh, but when I started the podcast, I would come off a podcast and think, oh, I don't know, that person's so intelligent and I don't know if I asked the right questions. Oh, yeah. And you know, a, a, But now I've got to the point where I have to realise that I do know the information I'm sharing and I have learned it and I read a lot of stuff. And so it's not like I'm just coming on here and talking about something I have no idea about. I actually research what I'm going to talk about. And it's a great feeling when you start to believe in who you are and what you can do, you know, like yourself, um, you know, with having a podcast. Yeah, we want more listeners. We want more people to know about what we're talking about. And it was only probably this year I actually had a time when I thought, look, I'm just going to close this down because I think I'm spending too much time doing what I'm doing. And I don't know if the message is getting out there enough because I don't get a lot of emails. I get messages on Instagram. And then I thought, look, I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. This is what I really like. I love hearing people's stories. So let's just keep going. And now this new season that you're in, all these new people have come out of the woodwork. And it's like, wow, these are people I really want to talk to. I guess I was just trudging through life going, oh, yeah, I'll talk to this person. Oh, yeah, I'll talk to that person. Not past guests, but new people I was looking at. And then you came forward and the person before that I interviewed before you came forward. And it was like it reinvigorated myself and made me realise oh, that awesome. this is really good and people are really enjoying it. And it doesn't matter if we have a 1,000 people listening, 2 million people listening, as long as we're enjoying what we're doing. I mean, look, you and I probably, if we had 2, min- two million people listening a week, we'd probably be going, oh, my God, what am I going to put on the next show? <laughs> so it's <Yeah>. actually... <clears throat> And I said to someone else recently, it's the learning as you're going with the podcast. Because one person said to me, I want to be successful like you. And I go, look, I'm nearly three years into this. I've spoken to, I think it's about 170 people. And that's what it takes. Each person you learn so much from. It can't be just, all right, I want to be successful. And you've got a number one podcast. You could probably pay your way there, I guess. But yeah, it it takes work and it takes listening to people and understanding people. Yeah. And like you're saying that, that faith in yourself, you know, the, probably the reason I didn't reach out before is to you and to other podcasts is just doubting myself, even before coming on today, even though I know this subject, I like, it happened to me. I still like, you know, that inner critic, like, uh, am I going to totally mess it up? Am I going to say the wrong thing? So yeah, I think it's important to share that too. So other people may have that, but if people don't share their vulnerabilities, if they don't show, share what someone might consider a weakness, then I don't know. Uh, that's why I, I do it all the time on my show. Like no, I, I tell people what I'm struggling with, like, cause that way if they're dealing with something, whether it's the same thing or something similar, like they know that they're not alone. Like I think most people are dealing with something, uh, you know, I, I, because so many people, even just the fear of death, you know, or, or, or blocking that, like how many problems that causes uh, things that people would never even consider. Uh, so and look you're right I mean every time I do a podcast probably about five minutes before I do it I quickly write some notes and I think to myself oh are we going to have a connection what are we going to talk about blah 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 blah. but then it just opens up and we wouldn't be human if we didn't have that mild anxiety before we started because I've never met you we've shared a few messages and it's always like oh what's this person going to be like Will I know what to say to them? You know, are they going to be really boring? So we all have all these different things that run through our head. And then we start and we go, actually, no, this is really good. We're connecting. We know what we're talking about. So, yeah, look, the inner critic is is something that can be really hard. Mm -hmm. For sure. So do you go around and talk to different, like, sporting groups about your experience? I want to, the pandemic definitely put a stop to that. So it wasn't a good time to put the book out. Um, I, one of my, I dropped off copies to, uh, I went to a junior college for, uh, I played football there for a year. uh, Well, yeah, one season, but I dropped off books there. Uh, They talked to the coaches. They want to bring me on, but 
this whole pandemic has just made talking, uh, especially to students, really difficult. I'm hoping next year to be able to do it. My problem is I get so distracted or, or so overwhelmed, like with all my other books. As soon as this book came out, I wanted to just move on to my next book. Like, all right, now I'm on fiction now because I really have, uh, I think, four different books in the works, plus I'm working on a novel. And so, you know, it's really hard to concentrate on this. But every once in a while, I'll get a message from someone saying, oh, I just read this book. I realize, okay, it is important. I, I do need to get this message out. I can't just forget about it. I can't just let it go because if there's one person that's listening that just decides to take a look at themselves and maybe get some help, then that's awesome. Then this was great. Um, even if there's no one listening, like you said, man, I've made so many friendships just through podcasts with people and you don't always hit it off with the other person, but like this, like, it's cool. You know, I, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate what you're doing and this has been fun. Look, and I guess also what you were saying earlier, <clears throat> there is the chance of, you are reaching out to those schools and coaches and football teams and stuff and them not wanting to have a bar of it because they don't want to accept the responsibility of what could be happening. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. Coaches care about their players. 100%. Like, you know, I, I don't think it's bad at all, but I just think it's, yeah, it's something that they don't really want to hear. Uh, they don't want to deal with, um, yeah, they, they don't want their responsibility. Same with whether it's MMA or boxing or whatever. They might put money into programs and everything else, but they don't want to like shine a spotlight on it and let the players know like, hey, this is really what's happening to your brain and you should really be careful. Um, I know my high school wouldn't want me to come and talk to the football team. You know, I, I, I couldn't see that happening. Maybe college. Uh, but even that would be pushing it. But that's on my list of things to do over the summer is write to all these different athletic directors. You know, I think it's important. I, I think, and it's kind of like, hey, this is to cover your ass a little bit because you're not telling these kids what they're risking, you know, yeah. for your college. Uh, so, yeah, I will be sending off those. I do, I do want to spread the message. Look, and I think um, before we talked on, on the podcast, I was saying to you about how it's being highlighted here in Australia now in Australian rules football. And, um, you know, it might even be worth you reaching out to some of those uh, football, to the, like the Australian Football League, um, because, yeah, it, it's becoming a lot more prevalent. And if they were to wear some sort of helmet, does it prevent this or does it? I mean, because the helmets seem pretty soft anyway. Right. It doesn't stop the the damage. Uh, yeah, I think it softens the damage. And and again, I don't know the stats, uh, but the book Head Games by uh, Chris Nowinski, he runs the Concussion Legacy Foundation. He was talking about like little kids and a lot of people say, well, you know, if they have their helmets on and the helm, you know, they have new safer helmets and uh, he goes into why that's really not the case, how it's not stopping that blow, the, yeah. the brain from going. So and, and maybe it lowers it, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, and so may, maybe helmets would help, but in football, you know, they're wearing helmets, they're wearing the best helmets and those guys are. Oh, and they've got all the big know, gear around yeah, them, haven't they? Yeah. And, you know, it's this accumulation and that's what I think a lot of people should focus on too. It's like, okay, when did this person start playing? Uh, right now the CLF, they put out something, I think it's every year before 14, the, their push is not to let your kids play a contact sport before 14 years old. So right. don't play uh, tackle football or something like, or, or head the ball in soccer. Um, I think every year prior, it, adds a certain percentage that you're going to get CT. So if you've been playing Pop Warner, like young football, which a lot of Americans would do, uh, you know, guys that go on to the pros, they might have played, you know, since they were six years old or seven years old, uh, tackle football. So um, their odds of, you know, getting CTE are going to be way, way higher than someone else. Yeah. And so if you've had a lot of years of playing rugby, then yeah, there's a, there's a good chance, you know, or, or a lot of years of playing soccer and heading the ball, there's a good chance that you probably did, you know, alter your brain a little bit, but you can totally, you could find out, you can, you could do the scans. Uh, there's another kind of scan. It's a little bit more expensive from Dr. Amen called the SPECT scan, S-P-E-C-T, that measures blood flow. But again, another way to see what's going on in your brain, why you feel the way you do. Uh, Dr. Amen's book, uh, The End of Mental Illness, uh, that's an excellent book for someone that's trying to get an idea of what's wrong with them because 
he has all these different pictures of the brains and all these different symptoms. It's like, okay, if you have all these things, then you're probably dealing with this. And if you have all this, you know, here's traumatic brain injuries. Here's, here's, uh, you know, mold, here's this, here's that. So, uh, I think that's a very good source. Um, uh, you know, that was an excellent book to learn from. Yeah, brilliant. Look, I mean, it's been fascinating to speak to you and it's really good that you're highlighting this issue uh, because it's something uh, I don't think comes up enough because there are a lot of people out there who I guess they want to address it, but they also don't want to lose what's going on. And as we spoke before, you know, there'd be a lot of kids who are one eyed about what they want to do. And, and that's what they're really good at. One of the guys who works for me, uh, he was doing really well in Australian rules football. And then he had two shoulder injuries and he can't play anymore. And when I said to him, so why do you work in disability now? He said, look, you know, I, all I ever wanted to do was football. Now my arms are screwed, so I can't play football. And I had to find something else that I was passionate about. And he said it was about working with people with disability and maybe going on to learning to be a physio and working with people who have been injured. And I was like, wow, that's really good. So you've turned what you're passionate about into something else that you're passionate about. And I guess for some of these guys who this is happening to, we've got to help them find a passion, which is still sport related, but something else that they can do where they're not going to put themselves uh, at the chance of having more trauma. Right, right. Yeah. And that's, I think that's one of the big things too, is just knowing when to stop. When should you stop fighting? Uh, that's something that I've seen a lot of my friends uh, struggle with. Lots of guys that I interviewed, you know, they went on to fight in the UFC, the ultimate fighting championship, and then maybe they got cut, you know, and then they keep fighting and then maybe they get a really bad injury and lose some fights and then they keep fighting and several concussions. And so it's like, when do you stop this? The only reason I stopped was I had a really bad concussion. I lost like 15 minutes of time. I, I remember seeing the punch come. I still continue to fight for a couple more minutes. I walked to the locker room, but from the time that punch came to me talking, sitting in the locker room, talking to my coach, um, I, I don't remember any of it. So that 15 minutes was just gone. So yeah. that scared me enough to say, okay, I, I shouldn't do this anymore. Uh, so it's, it's really hard, whether it's football, whether it's, uh, you know, rugby, what, whatever it is. If that's your sport, that's a very, very difficult thing to give up, especially for something you can't see. You know, if, if you get a scan of your brain or if you see these test scores, like that helps. But otherwise, it's like, it, you know, you can't see it. So it's just you you wonder what's wrong with you and, you know, or write it off. But, uh, yeah. I guess we also have to look into that, though, as the socioeconomic of what that person is coming from because, you know, some of the great fighters came from really bad um, poverty-stricken childhoods and then they're up there and they're starting to make even small amounts of money and they realise, look, this is a way of helping my family get from there to somewhere better. Um, so it, it's not just, you know, you've got a brain injury and you need to stop. They've also got all those other things behind them that they're looking at and someone who's been bullied or hasn't had a great childhood and all of a sudden, no, you were saying, you know, and then everybody sort of liked you because you're a fighter and, mm -hmm. you know, you get that bravado, I guess. That, that's a great feeling. So yeah. you are giving up the person you're turning into to say, okay, I have to stop this because of my brain injury and it would be hard to find something else that you want to do. I mean, look, you, you've gone on and become a successful writer, podcaster, um, you know, good for you. No, well, thanks. Yeah. And, and a hundred percent, this is my passion. I, I enjoyed that stuff, but yeah, ever since I started, I found writing, which I didn't find until after college. Um, yeah, it, I've, I've realized like, okay, I'm doing this until I can't do it anymore. You know, and that's one reason why I was really afraid of dementia too, because I was like, man, I have so many books. I have enough book ideas and like stuff plotted out probably for the next 15 years if I don't come up with anything new. So I was like, I want to be able to do that. Uh, you know, that's what drives me talking with new people. That's what drives me. Um, yeah. Sharing uh, even in my newsletter, I have a weekly newsletter and I think about how much time it takes me to do that in the podcast, you know, that's Thursday and Friday, or I'm not really doing anything creative. I'm doing this. I was like, but no, I was like, I'm talking to people. I'm reaching people. I was like, you know, it, it's such a cool feeling. Like, there's people that want to open up my newsletter and actually read it. I was like, that's, you know, that that's mind blowing for me, you know, for someone that has such as dealt with like low self-esteem. So uh, I was like, no, like I will, I'll put myself into this. I'll share my life, you know, and, and I get all kinds of cool interactions back. So uh, yeah, no, this is, this is definitely my passion. 
And, and look, you're right. So when, when you're authentic and you start sharing your real self, that's when people start interacting back with you. And that's what I found. Once I started talking about my illnesses and uh, my broken up marriage and stuff like that, people were like, oh, I was so happy when you talked about that because I realised that I was the same as you, that, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm not someone who was completely different and it was all my fault, you know. And, And when we can open up and talk about those things, yeah, people then go, actually, I feel okay about myself again. I don't feel like I'm the worst person on the planet. Because we can't, and you've probably felt like that, and I felt like that at some point in my life where I feel like, what can I do? I'm obviously rubbish. And then we come through that and then we start to realise that, no, we're not actually rubbish. We've just been broken down by someone or something and we can rebuild ourselves back up. Yeah. And I think something that I've noticed lately too is people putting themselves down because they just think that because of their position in life, because of the job that they have, because of whatever, they're lesser than you know, celebrities or, or whoever it might be. I was like, no, man, everyone is awesome. Everyone is incredible. You could have an incredible impact on like, talk to someone today, talk to another person, you know, down the street, a new neighbor, whatever, anyone, some at the store, like you could have a big impact on them. You could change their life without even knowing it. We're all special. We're all important. I think that's a cool way to uh, yeah, think about it. And I think uh, social media has something to do with that, with people feeling that they're not good enough. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't generally share. I just share positive updates. I don't share things that are about, you know, being bigger or smaller or, you know, because I don't want people to compare themselves to other people. Uh, Mm -hmm. However, I do see lots of that come through my feed of, oh, I've been working out and I look like this. And I think that's great for you. There's other people out there who are anorexic or, you know, feel really shit about how they look or how they feel. So the more positivity we can put out there, the better. Look, it's been a great chat, Mark. Really good. Do you want to say where people can find your podcast and your website and your books? Yeah. Um, Everything is on marktulius.com. The podcast is on Apple, Spotify, everywhere else. That is Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. And pay attention to episode 165. That will be with amazing Daniel Silk. And all my books are on Amazon. You can also get all my audio books on Audible and Find A Way. All right. Well, I'm going to have to have a have a look at one of your books and have a read of it because, yeah, look, we, we only actually connected earlier this week and uh, it was just lucky that I said to you, hey, should we do two back to back and let's get them out this weekend? And that's what we did. Yeah. It's yeah, way to no, do it. Awesome. Otherwise, I find that I'm, I'm people are waiting and waiting and then they contact me and I go, oh, God, you contacted me last year and still haven't got through to you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I really, I really appreciate you having me on and helping me share this message. It's been a lot of fun. Look, it's an important message, and I'm glad that you contacted me because, yeah, this should be more spoken about, and it will help a lot of young, I guess, more towards men, but also women who are playing sport, just to be wary of what they're doing and how they're how they're playing the game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Mark. Nice to meet you. Bye bye. Well, that was another episode of Life Changes You. If you want to contact us, we're available on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we also have a website, lifechangesyou.com.au. So until next time, take care of each other, and thanks for listening.